What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Traditional Press. We're going to be talking about the separation of church and state and why this is not a thing that you should want. In fact, what we are going to do today is discuss the reasons why separation of church and state is even in the thought of the modern man and what caused that to happen and why this is incongruous with his nature. Because natural man has no problem at all with religion. It is only the modern man that has begun to believe himself more evolved than his predecessors, which is the definition of hubris, by the way. But that's what we're going to talk about. So, separation of church and state. What is it? What does it actually mean? There's a lot of debate on this particular subject, but basically you can break it down to the idea that the government is supposed to operate without any interference from the church. And this seems to be a very good idea when you have a state that has multiple different religions all trying to coexist simultaneously. And the proponents of the separation of church and state seem to have very good arguments at first because they say things like, well, how can you have a state influence on, or, or how can you have a church influence on the state when you have all these different religions? Won't you be infringing upon the rights and the liberties of the other religions when you begin to incorporate this one particular religion into state because they believe different things. They hold different gods as all powerful or as, you know, the, the definition of right and wrong. And they, they have very different tenets of the sorts of things that they believe. In fact, it wasn't that long ago, maybe a month ago in Michigan, the city of Dearborn voted to allow animal sacrifice to take place within their bounds. The council is Islamic and in Islam animal sacrifice is apparently a very big thing and the idea that animal sacrifice could be allowed in the modern world is kind of astonishing first of all but that's because we've forgotten that oh yeah religions really have impact and they really change the way that people think and the way that people act in the world and Guess what? Everybody has a religion, including you, Mr. Atheist Pants over there. Everybody's got a religion. Your religion just so happens to be secularism, otherwise known as pantheism, nihilistic pantheism. But I'm not going to get into all that, though. One of these days, I'm going to do a video on, the, on the, the mythology of the modern atheist. But that is not this day. Instead, we're going to talk about why... People, I mean, obviously, you know, have come to this conclusion, and that's because in the modern world, people are living in these melting pot states and more and more and more because the model of the United States has been held up to the rest of the world as the ultimate ideal, as the greatest achievement of mankind. And so the rest of the world has actually been adopting to varying degrees of success much of that which the United States does. And it's not good for them. And they are discovering, wait a minute, we don't like losing our entire culture by mishmashing and mashing disparate groups of people together that don't get along. And this isn't working out so well. But you know what? The United States has to fall before anybody will be able to realize the gravity of that mistake. And we are seeing that today where the United States is less and less stable every minute. And that's just the natural reaction that's going to happen when you mix X and B together, in this case, liberalism and people. And we are going to see that uh, the United States is going to fall apart more and more every day. But so where it comes to, so think with me for a moment, if you had the church directly influencing the state, first of all, you would have to pick what church is going to be influencing the state. And it doesn't work in a melting pot, as I you know, said earlier, and as the proponents of the, um, you know, the separation of church and state say, they're like, this isn't gonna work because all these people are believing all these different things. And this is where it gets really interesting because that actually has a very high degree of sense to it at first. 
because how can you infringe on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? If you're messing with people's religions, you're messing with their pursuit of happiness, you're messing with their life, you're messing with everything. Religion is such a big deal. And, you know, you can't really ever get away from that issue unless you have a homogenous traditional culture, which of course I advocate pretty heavily for on this channel. But when you have an issue like, for example, right now, uh, Russia's going through a thing where they're becoming more and more traditional, but they have an enormous Islamic population now in significant sections of their state. And so they're finding that they couldn't just go and become Orthodox Christian again. They had to incorporate Islam as or in order to not tick off, you know, all this significant section of their section of their population. So it's a big deal. And you can't just ignore this subject. So it's a kind of a d difficult philosophical quandary to get into. And that's what I love. I love nothing better on this press channel of mine in order to uh, d than discussing the deepest and darkest and most uh, difficult philosophical subjects. So that's why I'm here. That's why you're here. And that's why we're going to have a good time. The problem is... You have to have some form of religion in your government or else your government begins to break down. So you were, it doesn't begin to break down. It goes straight into tyranny. Like without religion, there's no guiding force to your decision making. There's nothing to control the people in, in power. There's no need for self-control, which is the greatest form of control that exists in the universe. It's the most powerful, it's the most potent, it's the most natural. Everything about self-control is ideal. Laws and all of these things and, and orders and justice and, you know, everything that you can imagine with a government is completely irrelevant with perfect self-control. With perfect self-control, you don't need a government. Every, everyone will just behave. But because people don't behave, you have to have governments. And what happens when your governments decide to misbehave? And that's where religion comes into play more even than politics because religion keeps your people on a particular path and whatever your religion is that religion has a specified path to succeed to um, channel your aggression to um, you know tell you what justice is to guide your life without those things you're just making it up you know you may feel like you're a good person at first but the reality is that kind of goes away when you get the reins of power. And then it's kind of a difficult thing. And without a massive influential force in your life, unfortunately, the atheists kill a lot of people, like a lot of people. <laughs> and the atheists also have a religion. And this is part and parcel with this conversation because they believe things. And if you think that you're a good person, you're basing that goodness on a standard. And that standard you're getting from outside of yourself. Because you can't just look at yourself and get all of the answers because you don't know what another person is until you look outside of yourself and see another person, meaning that it's impossible for you to come to conclusions about justice in society because without looking at other people because other people are where the injustices are taking place so it's not possible for you to have a perfect moral code within inside of you um, to come it's not possible for a perfect moral code to come from within because there are other people and then when you start looking at other people you begin to realize that they have very different perspectives on the world than you do and if you're only looking at other people through the lens of yourself, you're projecting yourself onto that other person. You're not really seeing that other person, you're seeing yourself. You might as well be looking in a mirror. It, but if you're looking objectively at other people and you're allowing those other people to enter into your consciousness, to touch your spirit, and your spirit to go out to them, then what you have is this mythical, mystical, incredible relationship thing that we just crave as human beings. And when we go and we do this thing, we begin to see, okay, well, wait a minute. Now we have to interact with each other in some way, but you believe something different than I believe regarding justice. You happen to think that you should be able to pay no taxes at all, and I happen to think that you had better pay your fair share. And suddenly we have an issue of justice. And 
we have to have frameworks. And then, you know, people say, well, politics can solve that by just saying, everybody can just do this one thing. Everybody's got this tax system. We're going to make it fair. Fair according to who? Once again, you have to have religion in order to tell you what fair is, in order to tell you who who is, in order to tell you what anything is, you have to have a spiritual framework in order to be able to understand people, in order to be able to communicate with other people, and more importantly, in order to be able to commune with other people. The social aspect of politics is the most important part of politics. And the social aspect is like this enormous, complicated thing because people are complicated and the world is a complicated place. And so you have to have a complicated set of frameworks in or a complicated framework set up in order to be able to help you navigate these difficult and dangerous waters. And that's the purpose of religion. So enough said on the purpose of religion. It's important, you have to have it. But what religion do you have and how do you make that religion fit over all of these other people? And that's where the question gets really difficult again. And in order to get an answer to that, we have to ask questions about goodness and what is the most natural thing that we can do? What is the healthiest thing for humans? We have to look at history in order to see how did other people do it and we have to be very wary of tyranny because tyranny is all too likely to occur when you start attempting to reintroduce on purpose the state into uh, or the the church into state so if for example i lived in the city of dearborn i would be totally disenfranchised because I'm not Islamic. And if they're making laws to govern me, those laws are going to be Islamic and they're going to be counter to my belief system. Now they haven't done, you know, a, a, a difficult Iranian level, you know, women have to wear hijabs and my wife wouldn't have to wear a hijab and, and all that kind of stuff in order to live there right now but if the islamic council was able to get away with circumnavigating the whole religious freedom issue in the united states yeah they would require hijabs and my wife would have to wear one in order to live there or else she would go to jail and i would probably go to jail and it would be a whole thing and that's that contention is why people want just just separate them. You can't you can't put them together. Just separate them. No, you can't have any religion influence the state. And it sounds good until you realize that somebody's going to be in government and that person brings their totality of themselves into that position. You can't separate out the man from the office because you can't put an idea behind the desk. You have to put flesh and blood into the role. You have to give them the, the pen of power in the judicial office or the legislative or executive, whatever. You have to give them that. And it has to be a real human being. Be, you can't say, well, you know, I have this concept that I want to run the world with. Too bad. You're never going to get the perfect con concept unless you have an artificial intelligence, you know, that's perfectly tuned to do, to give whatever you want. And maybe some people out there want robots to run us, but I don't want Skynet quite yet. <laughs> and without robots, you're going to have to have people. So the people issue becomes a religion issue. And if, again, you're living in Dearborn, it's fair for the Dearborn Council, city council, to make Islamic laws because they're Islamic. They're Muslims. They should make Muslim laws because that's who they are and that's what they do. And if they were not doing that, then they were lying, being disingenuous and not being true to themselves. And they were twisting their office out of proportion with their own consciousness conscience. 
And once you say to someone, you are not allowed to follow your conscience when you're making laws, what have you actually done to them? You've destroyed their ability to be moral because now they have to base their laws on something else, something that is not that their own moral code, something that is opposed to their moral code or not in alignment with their moral code that is not religious. And once you've done that, you've told that person that that which guides their life is of no value because if their Islamic tradition is not good enough to govern their own people, to govern themselves, to govern their city, then their Islamic tradition is not good because if it's not, if it was good, it would be good everywhere in every case because that's what goodness means. Unless you mean, well, sometimes things are good and sometimes things aren't good. Well, we're not talking about, you know, sometimes it's okay to lie to the Gestapo. We're not talking about that. We're talking about virtues. Virtues are always good. It is always virtuous. It is always good to be an honest person. We're not saying, you know, obviously there's exceptions to this. And again, the exceptions make things more fun to talk about, but the reality is, if you separate things out like, you know, in the Christian tradition, for example, it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And you go and you make laws that say, it's perfectly acceptable to have the Hindu gods in our community. Well, you've told the community that, you're, that the community is allowed to disobey your religion, which means that you don't really believe that your religion is good enough to govern the world. You don't believe that your religion is true because if you actually believe that thou shalt have no other gods before me and you were governing a nation, you would govern the nation by the principles of your religion. And the reason why you have to do this is because if you are not governing according to your own religious principles, then you're governing according to their religious principles. Now you're governing according to the Hindu um, you know, uh, religious principles because you're saying your religious principles are the equal to my religious principles. If you believe that, then you are in violation of your own religious principles. So if you are not in charge of anybody, this situation doesn't matter at all. It just, it really, it, it doesn't come up. And which is why most of the time Christians are going to say, well, pff, you know, I'm not going to discriminate against my Hindu neighbors, nor should you. It's not your place. Like, what on earth? You're not in charge of anything. That's ridiculous. But if you were in charge and you said, oh, yeah, 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 it's it's fine to to have, uh, you know, Buddhism in our in our country. It's fine to have Islam and Islamicism in our country. It's fine to have everything in our country. What you end up with is transhumanism which is what we're getting today, which says that no religion matters because that's what you've told everybody. Because when you're in charge and you tell everybody, oh, by the way, I have, all, I have this religion, but my religion isn't good enough to govern you, then why would anybody think that? So if you say, as a leader, my religion that I hold is not good enough to govern the people, why would the people believe in your religion? Why would the people give a care about your religion? Your religion isn't good enough to govern them. If it was good enough to govern them, it would be governing them. Now you can say, and, and every single law that you make is a law regarding morals. Absolutely every single law that you make. There is not one single law that is possible to be made that is not made for the purposes of morality. If you ban cigarettes, you are banning cigarettes because you think that it is immoral for people to hurt themselves from smoking. That is a moral statement. If you ban speeding on a particular road over 35 miles an hour, that is because you think it is immoral for someone to drive 36 miles an hour and hit somebody crossing the crosswalk because they were going too fast and now they're going to cause chaos and damage and death. That's a moral statement 
because what you are attempting to eliminate by a speed limit law is death, is damage, is destruction of property, is danger to the residents, is people driving just too fast. You know, you're making these moral statements because damaging somebody's property, you're saying that's a bad. Why is it a bad? Well, because bads are immoral. All bads are immoral. And if it's bad and we're trying to ban it, we are imposing morality on that on that community. Every single law is an imposition of morality on a community. Every single law. There is no single law that does not attempt to impose a particular set of beliefs on someone else. I'm opposed to speed limits. Too bad. They're part of the law. Why? Because the government has imposed speed limits on me. The reason I'm opposed to speed limits is because I think that our road systems are ridiculous and they shouldn't be shaped the way that we are, that they are. Road systems should be shaped for walking, bicycling, natural human transport, not vehicular transport, because that form of transport is not as natural to us and it creates just an incredible amount of tyranny in the policing of good, honest, law-abiding citizens and it does virtually nothing to stop criminal activity. I know that the law enforcement loves speed limits because they can pull over crummy looking cars and they'll catch their drug dealers and all these other things, but they could pull over a crummy looking car if there were no speed limits. And I've driven crummy looking cars, so <laughs> I know that I would have been a target. Um, but regardless, it's an imposition of someone else's morality on me. Every single law is an imposition of morality, meaning that it is not possible to legislate without invoking morals. And if you're going to invoke morals, you must pick. And the only real question that we have is, how do you impose your morals on someone who disagrees with you? And you say, well, that's just crazy. It happens every single day. Every single day someone in the legislative body is writing a law that I disagree with. Somebody's imposing their morals on me and you don't have a problem with that. And you probably also don't have a problem with the fact that somebody's writing laws that you disagree with right now. Maybe you're on one side of the tax issue or you're on the other side of the tax issue. Somebody's writing a law that you disagree with. There is never going to be a situation where somebody is not imposing their laws and their morals on you. That's what government is. So, understanding this, looking at it from this perspective of inevitability, we begin to understand now why historically, remember how I mentioned that we have to look historically, why those people in the past always attempted to establish state religions. Because they believed that the morals that they had were good. They were actually good. And if they're actually good, you're going to govern according to your morals. And you're not going to play all these fancy, stupid little games, dancing around the issue saying, oh, I believe what I believe and you can believe what you believe, even though what you believe is that you should be able to kill babies. Who cares what you believe if you believe that you can slaughter millions of babies? Like, you're ridiculous. You should never get to make that statement. But they do. You know, we believe that we should mutilate our children if they decide that they don't feel comfortable in their own bodies. Okay, well, that's horrifying. And why would anybody agree with that? But people do every day, all the time. All over the world, millions of people agree with us. They have a set of morals. And I have a set of morals. But I'm not going to be a coward and say that my set of morals is not good enough to govern them. Because if my set of morals is good enough to govern me, it must also be good enough to govern the world. And this is why it is such a monumentally spiritual task to be a leader. To be in a position of authority is extraordinarily important and difficult to do. And there's a reason why in the Christian tradition, it says that the leaders are going to be judged more heavily than those of us who are not in positions of leadership. And the reason for that is obvious because they are doing more damage when they're in the wrong and they are, they have a much more difficult job, way more difficult. Obviously, everyone's lives are on their line and if they're wrong, they could be damaging 
you know, untold numbers of people. I mean, how many people did Hitler damage? He had a very strong set of morals. And I think I disagree with his morals pretty strongly. <laughs> the morals of Adolf Hitler, however, it, he believed were good enough to govern him. Therefore, they must also be good enough to govern the rest of their people. And that imagery is why people don't want church involved in, in the state at all. They don't want it. They're scared of people like Adolf Hitler. And that's perfectly fair. You know what I'm afraid of? Living in Dearborn because of the what I would find to be tyrannical rule of the Islamic city council there. Maybe they're great people. I don't know. I've never met them. That's not the point. I'm afraid of living under the rule of baby killing, child mutilating, neo-fascist liberals. <clears throat> I think they're tyrannical. And I think that they're going to destroy more people than were destroyed in the 20th century. I think that there's going to be probably, you know, several hundred million people dead from the neo-fascist liberal agenda through civil wars, through man-made pandemics, through whatever it is that they're going to do in order to, to, to accomplish what they want. I hope I'm wrong about that. I'd love to be wrong about that. World War III, probably also, we can throw that in there. And if there, if there is a World War III, there'll be a lot more than 100 million people dead. Uh, <laughs> but the policies and the politics and the morals of the neo-fascists are really antithetical to my belief systems. They're, they're totally opposed. We can't get along, which means that every time that when I engage in politics, I'm doing my utmost to eliminate that organization, that thought process, and those people that hold those positions from the political office. That's what an election is. I'm voting for my guy. You're voting for your guy. You want your guy to defeat me, and I want my guy to defeat you because we disagree. Like, that's the whole point of politics. But the difference between an election and a religious state is that the state says, no, you don't ever get to destroy us. You don't ever get to elect Islamic, heavy, you know, heavily tr traditional Islamic uh, factions to our government because we don't approve of this. And we're not going to come to your door and smash it down and drag you out into the street because you believe something because that's insane and not in, a, in accordance with my Christian tradition. But we're never going to allow you to have a political position of power because what you believe is totally against what I believe. I believe that what you believe is evil. And if I be actually believe that Islam is evil, you know, anything that's not Christianity is by definition evil. If I believe that what you believe is actually evil, then there is never a time or a place where we can ever agree that you should be in control of me. That's never going to happen. Not ever. And it can't. And we can get along. We can be friends even. We can have a great time. We can talk. We can do all these things. But you can't make laws which are going to be opposed to my beliefs. And if you do, you're engaging in tyranny over me. And I can understand that you would find my governance to be tyranny over you. And so that's where it gets difficult. Because in order to enact my set of religious beliefs, there's only one thing that I can really do. And that's try to be as gentle in my imposition of my beliefs on you as I could possibly be. And I think that traditional, historical monarchy is going to be the most gentle form of imposition that can exist. I think that the whole idea of religious freedom is not only impossible, but insane. And the pursuit of religious freedom in a nation 
only ever guarantees that you will be tyrannized over because somebody that you disagree with is always going to get into a position of power and destroy you. So the ideal here being, if you believe something, you should work towards a traditional monarchy, which is going to support your beliefs. And if you believe something, you need to make sure that what you believe is historical and traditional and unchanging. Because if you believe something today and 20 years from now, you're in a completely different denomination or your denomination has left you more likely, then what you believed wasn't really good enough. And if your traditions are always breaking down, then you can never have a government with a healthy church-state balanced relationship. So in order to have a balanced relationship, you must have a church which is resilient enough to last for you know hundreds of years. You have to have some Taoist uh, religion that's going to last you for a thousand years. You're going to have to have some historical, traditional Islamic tradition that's going to last you for thousands of years. Whatever you need, whatever you actually believe, that's what you need to be working towards. And because I really believe this, I think that it's important to work towards a traditional and historical Christian monarchy, which is orthodox. I believe in an orthodox um, monarchy because you have to have a religion which is not going to shatter and fragment because if you're part of a tradition which has traditionally left you and left its people behind and had gazillions of church splits then you're basically guaranteeing a civil war within your country because either the king is going to go with this faction or the king is going to go with this faction and the other faction is not going to be disenfranchised and you're going to have this horrible conflict between them like what happened during all of the reformation revolts and either that's going to happen or you're, you're going to end up with just absolute tyranny where you know one the king is going to decide you know what this religion thing is ridiculous we don't need it i'm going to do whatever i want and that happens a lot of times and these impious kings come along and that and that's basically the end and and you failed your country because you had a religion that wasn't resilient enough to withstand pressures both internal and external to be able to last for a significant period of time and that's one of the many 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 reasons why religion has to be like capital R religion if this is going to work at all. Because it's not enough to say, well, I have a moral code. You know, the Bible tells me to do this. Well, you know, that's great. But unless you have a tradition of literally millions of people that all believe the same thing about the Bible as what you believe and have developed those beliefs into a known, recognized, and accepted religious code and have passed down that code for many generations and that code is unbreakable and unchangeable, you know, even within your own tradition, you can't break and change the rules. Unless you get to that point, it's not enough just to say, well, the Bible tells me this. Because you can't be a state unto yourself. You have to have a group of people which is going to be, you know, large enough in order to actually be a state. So these both of these things have to work together. You have to have both church and state simultaneously working together in harmony and coexisting with each other in order to make this work. So... Hopefully we've gone over enough of this. There's some things I could have said, some things I decided to leave out, but that's okay. There's a lot more to be talked about on the traditional press. Thank you guys so much for listening. Loved having all of you on here. Please leave a like. I would tremendously, tremendously appreciate it. Please subscribe. You'll just bless my heart and soul if you can give me a subscription here. It matters a ton. I love that you all listen to this video. Thank you so much. Stay strong out there, and I'll catch you all next time. This has been the Traditional Press Podcast. Thank you for listening, and tune in next time for more traditional ideas and exploration of the why behind the what.